you. Ah. Hello, everyone. I'm RJ Michael. I'm director of games for Google. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you today one Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil is one of the world's leading inventors, thinkers, and futurists. With a 30-year track record of accurate predictions, he's called many things by a number of sources. He's called the restless genius by the Wall Street Journal, the ultimate thinking machine by Forbes magazine, PBS selected him as one of their 16 revolutionaries who made America. Kurzweil was selected as one of the top entrepreneurs by Inc. Magazine, who described him as the rightful heir to Thomas Edison. Kurzweil was a pr principal inventor of the first CCD flatbed scanner, the first omnifont optical character recognition system. He did the first omnifont OCR. He uh, did the first print-to-speech reading machine for the blind, the first text-to-speech synthesizer, the first music synthesizer capable of recreating the grand piano and other orchestral in instruments, and the first commercially marketed large vocabulary speech recognition system. This is the stuff that the guy's done with his life, with his career so far. Among his many honors, he's the recipient of the National Medal of Technology. He was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. He holds 20 honorary doctorates, and he has received honors from three U.S. presidents. Ray has written five national best-selling books, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Singularity is Near, in 2005, and more recently, How to Create a Mind, in 2012. He is director of engineering at Google. He's now heading up a team developing machine intelligence, and natural language understanding. He has also been a personal hero of mine since I was young. And, and he has this drive to make AI happen at Google. And I couldn't be more delighted to announce to you guys that as of today, I am now going to start exploring the entertainment and education space directly with Ray Kurzweil in his new organization. And who knows where this is going to go, but it's going to be awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce Ray Kurzweil. Oh, God. It's just oh. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, thanks, RJ. And uh, now that you're going to be working with me, we have to work on your enthusiasm a little bit. Uh, and it's great to be at Google. It's actually my first job. I'll talk a little bit more about what I'm doing. But I'd uh, like to share with you some ideas about thinking. I've been thinking about thinking for 50 years. Uh, first, I'd like to say a few words about the law of accelerating returns. I won't say too much about it, because Many of you have heard me talk about it before, but the law of accelerating returns is alive and well. It's not just Moore's law. I, I keep hearing people saying, well, Moore's law is coming to an end, as if that were synonymous with the exponential growth of information technology. Moore's law was just one paradigm among many. When I first studied this in 1981, Moore's law had only been underway for a few years, which is shrinking components on an integrated circuit. In the 1950s, they were shrinking vacuum tubes to keep this exponential growth going. Uh, if you, uh, Gordon Moore originally said uh, Moore's Law would come to an end in 2002. Justin Ratner, the CTO of Intel, now says 2022. But he'll also show you in their labs the sixth paradigm, three-dimensional self-organizing molecular circuits working, which will keep uh, the law of accelerating returns going well into late of this century. So what is the law of accelerating returns? It's not that everything grows exponentially or even every aspect of information technology. We were speeding up transistors, making them smaller so the electrons had less distance to travel, so transistors were faster. That was a sub-paradigm. I always felt we were going too fast. The human brain is actually very slow, computes about 100 calculations per second in the interneuronal connections. Uh, but it's massively parallel. It actually has a hundred trillion fold parallelism. There's uh, hundred billion neurons with about a thousand 
10,000 connections each, and that's where the computations take place. So it's very massively parallel, but slow, so it uses very little energy, and we needed to move more in that direction towards more parallelism and less speed. So speeding up transistors was just one sub-paradigm. And we already are, have taken steps in the third dimension. Uh, many memory circuits are already three-dimensional. Uh, the law of accelerating returns uh, is not limited at all to Moore's law. Moore's law is one paradigm among many in computation. Computation is one example of many of the law of accelerating returns. So what exactly does it pertain to? It pertains to the price performance and capacity of information technology and uh, every form of information technology. So uh, in computation, calculations per second per constant dollar has been speeding up at an exponential pace since the 1890 census. But it's also true of communications, biological technologies, brain scanning, modeling the brain, uh, being able to reprogram biological data, uh, printing, the uh, spatial resolution of three-dimensional printing, which is turning information into physical products. These are all examples of either price performance or capacity of information technology. And I'll show you this first example. I mean, this is the graph I had in 1981 of computation. It's a logarithmic scale. Every label level is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. And uh, so this represents trillions fold increase in calculations per second per constant dollar. Uh, Moore's law is the fifth paradigm. But notice how smooth a, a, a trajectory that is. It really has a mind of its own. It goes through thick and thin, through one piece. And exponential growth, the second point I want to make, is not intuitive. If you ever wonder, gee, why do I have a brain? It's really to make predictions about the future so we can anticipate the consequences of our action and the consequences of inaction. Uh, but those built-in predictors are linear. When we were walking through the fields a thousand years ago, you know, we would make a prediction, okay, that animal's going that way. I don't want to meet him. I'm going to go a different route. That was good for survival. That became hardwired in our brains. But those predictors are linear. And people still use their linear intuition about the future. That's the pr principal difference between myself and my critics. We're both looking at the same reality. We have similar judgments about it. And if I thought progress was linear, I'd be pessimistic also. Uh, and many things are linear. Biology, health and medicine was linear. That was still useful. The life expectancy was 19 a thousand years ago. We've quadrupled it. I talked recently to some junior high school students and pointed out they would all be senior citizens if it hadn't been for that progress. Uh, life expectancy was 37 200 years ago. Schubert and Mozart died in their 30s of bacterial infections and that was typical. That's all been from linear progress. Exponential progress is quite different. You know, a linear progression, that's, that's our intuition about the future, goes one, two, three. An exponential progression, that's a reality, not of everything, but of price performance capacity of information technology, goes one, two, four. Okay, it doesn't sound that different, except by the time you get to step 30, the linear progression, our intuition's at 30, the exponential progression uh, is at a billion. And that's not an idle speculation. I mean, this is several billion times more powerful uh, per dollar than the computer I used when I was an undergraduate at MIT. It's several trillion fold uh, since we started with the 1890 American census. But again, look at how smooth a progression that is. Nothing has any impact on it. The third point I want to make is that it's not just computation. It really affects every form of information technology. And information technology is ultimately going to transform everything we care about as a result of application developers like yourself. I mean, that's what drives it forward, and I'll say more about that. We could buy one transistor for a dollar in 1968. I was pretty excited about that because I was used to spending $50 for a telephone relay that could do that. We can now buy 10 billion. Costs for transistor cycles come down by half every year. Uh, that's a 50% deflation rate. So I can get the same computation or communication or biological technologies as I could a year ago for half the price. Economists actually worry about that because we had massive deflation during the Great Depression. A different reason, that was a collapse of consumer confidence. But the concern is if I can get the same stuff, and I'll talk about three-dimensional printing in a moment, so I do include physical stuff, for half the price, I'll buy more. I mean, that's economics 101, but I'm actually gonna double my consumption, and if I don't, 
let's say I increase my consumption in terms of bits and bytes 50%, which is a lot, uh, the size of the economy, not as measured in bits, bytes, and base pairs, but as measured in currency, will shrink. For a variety of good reasons, that would be a bad thing, but that's not what happens. I've got 50 different consumption charts like this. This is bits of memory uh, consumed. We actually more than double it every year. There's been 18% growth in constant currency each year for the last 50 years in every form of information technology, despite the fact that you can get twice as much of it each year for the same price. And the reason for that is application developers like all of you. I mean, why weren't there social networks eight years ago? Was it because Mark Zuckerberg was still in junior high school? No, there, there were attempts to do it, and there are arguments. You know, can we afford to allow our users to download a picture? The price performance wasn't there. Why weren't there search engines you know, more than 15 years ago? I wrote in the early 80s, when the ARPANET connected a few thousand scientists, that this was growing exponentially, would necessarily do that. This would therefore be a World Wide Web, I didn't use that term, uh, connecting hundreds of millions of people to each other and to vast knowledge resources by the late 90s. People thought that was nuts when the entire American defense budget could tie together a few thousand scientists. But that's the power of exponential growth. That's what happened. And I wrote that there'd be so much information, you couldn't find anything without search engines. And the computational and communication resources needed for a search engine would, would come into place. What you could not predict is that it would be these couple of kids in a Stanford dorm near here who would take over the world of search among the 50 projects that were seeking to do that. I'm not saying everything is predictable, but you could predict uh, that search engines would be needed and feasible in the late 90s, and Google was founded in 98. So Time Magazine wanted a particular computer they had covered as the last point uh, on this cover story about the law of accelerating returns. It's right there, and this was a curve I'd laid out 30 years earlier. So this is, in fact, very predictable. And in terms of all my predictions, when they're like this, in terms of actual numbers of price performance or capacity of different information technologies, they're really right on the money. If you Google how my predictions are faring, you'll get a 150-page essay uh, looking at all the predictions I've made as of that time, which was a couple of years ago, including 147 that I made in the Age of Spiritual Machines, which I wrote in the late 90s, came out in 99, about 2009. 78% were exactly correct uh, to the year, and these were predictions that were uh, by decade. Uh, another 8% were off one year, so I called them essentially correct. So 86% were correct or essentially correct. Uh, the ones that were wrong, uh, you know, included things like regulatory, and cultural issues, like for example, one that was wrong is that we'd have self-driving cars, which in fact began a glimmer of working in 2009. If, it would, if I had said 2014, it would have been correct because the Google self-driving cars have already gone 800,000 miles and Google's going to launch a fleet of experimental vehicles in Mountain View this year, but it wasn't correct for 2009. The uh, number of bits we move around wirelessly in the world. Uh, there was Morse over the last century. There was Morse code over AM radio uh, a century ago. Today's 4G networks. Trillions fold increase. Uh, but again, look at how smooth a trajectory that is. Internet data traffic doubling every year. Here's that graph I had of the ARPANET uh, in the early 80s and projected that out. The graph on the right is the same data, but on a linear scale. And that's how we experience it. Uh, we don't experience it in the logarithmic d domain. So to the casual observer, it looked like, whoa, World Wide Web, new thing, came out of nowhere, but you could see it coming. And biology, uh, this has been a perfect exponential. The Genome Project was announced in 1990, was not a mainstream project. Halfway through the project, critics blasted it, saying, look, you're it's halfway through this 15-year project, you've only collected 1% of the genome, so seven years, 1%, it's going to take 700 years, just like we said. My reaction is, we're at 1%, we're almost done, because it's an <laughs> exponential progression. Uh, and indeed, it was done seven years later, because 1% is seven doublings from 100%. That's continued since the end of the Genome Project. That first genome cost a billion dollars, we're now down to a few thousand dollars. But it's not just sequencing, we can now reprogram this outdated data. And there are many examples of that. 
at the Johnson Diabetes Center, they turned off the fat insulin receptor gene. We have technologies like RNA interference that can turn genes off. These animals ate ravenously and remained slim and lived 20% longer. Uh, I've worked with a company that adds a gene to patients with a terminal disease called pulmonary hypertension caused by one missing gene. Uh, they scrape out these cells non-invasively from the throat, add the gene in vitro, inspect it, got done correctly, replicated several million fold, another new technology. Uh, so they now have millions of cells with that patient's DNA, but with the gene they're missing, inject it back in the body, the body recognizes them as lung cells, and this has cured this terminal disease in human patients. Uh, there's an interesting case combining a number of different exponentially growing information technologies with this young girl who had a damaged windpipe. She was not going to be able to survive with it. So they scanned her throat with non-invasive imaging. Spatial resolution of non-invasive imaging is doubling every year. That's an uh, important technology for, for reverse engineering the brain. Uh, designed her a new windpipe in the computer using computer assisted design. Uh, printed it out with a 3D printer using biodegradable materials. Uh, then populated this scaffolding with her stem cells using the th same 3D printer. Uh, grew out uh, a new windpipe for her and installed it surgically and it worked fine. Uh, you can now fix a broken heart. Uh, not yet from romance, that'll take us a few more decades. Uh, but <clears throat> half of all heart attack survivors have a damaged heart, it's called low ejection fraction. My father had that in the 60s and could hardly walk. Uh, now you can fix that by reprogramming adult stem cells and rejuvenating the heart. You have to be a medical tourist, because it's not yet approved here, although it will be soon. There are many other examples we could talk all day about this, but our ability to reprogram this outdated software is growing exponentially. These technologies are now a thousand times more powerful than they were a decade ago when the general project was completed. They'll be another thousand times more powerful in a decade, a million times more powerful in 20 years. That's the implication of a doubling in power every year. Somewhere between that 10 and 20 year mark, we'll see significant differences in life expectancy, not just infant life expectancy, but your remaining life expectancy. Uh, the models that are used by life insurance companies sort of continue the linear progress we've made before health and medicine was in information technology, which was based on basically accidental findings. Uh, this is going to go into high gear. Uh, you know, life expectancy is a, st a statistical phenomena. You could still be hit by the proverbial bus tomorrow, because we're working on that here at Google also with self-driving cars. <laughs> and and three-dimensional printing, I think we're <clears throat> in the hype phase of this. Uh, I've written about the life cycle of technologies. They're usually early enthusiasts who see the vision, but haven't really calculated uh, the timing correctly, and exponential growth ultimately becomes transformative, but it actually starts out very slowly. You're doubling tiny little numbers, like one ten thousandths of the genome in 1990, two ten thousandths in 91. Uh, so the progress doesn't come on schedule, disillusionment uh, lets in, and then you have a, basically a bust, and then it comes back as we really truly understand the true markers of what it will take to be successful. Uh, this looks like a young audience, but you may remember the internet boom in the 1990s. You know, if you had the URL dog.com, you were a billionaire. Uh, then around the year 2000, people realized you can't really make money with these internet companies, and there was the internet bust, which almost took down the economy. But then it came back, and today you have internet companies like Google and Apple and Facebook that are worth, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, and we're kind of in that hype phase now. Uh, I think we're still five or six years away from the uh, parameters we need to make this successful, and we need submicron resolutions. The, re the resolution accuracy is improving at a rate of about 130 volume per decade, so it's exponential progress. But right now, it's, it's multi-micron. We can do interesting things. We had an opening a year ago at uh, Singularity University. Uh, where the band, all the instruments that the band was playing were printed out on three-dimensional printers. So they're interesting niche applications. But by 2020, we'll be able to print out clothing, for example. So people will go, great, there goes the fashion industry. But not so fast. I mean, look at <clears throat> other industries that have already undergone the transformation from physical products to digital products. A few years ago, if I wanted to send you a book or a movie or a music album, I'd send you a FedEx package. Today, I can send you 
an email attachment. And there's indeed an open source market with millions of free songs, videos, movies, books, documents that you can download legally for free and you can have a very good time with these free media products. Uh, but people still spend money to read Harry Potter or go to the latest blockbuster or get music from their favorite artists. And you have the coexistence of the open source market, which is a great leveler, bringing high quality products to everyone at almost no cost or no cost and a proprietary market, that'll be the nature of the economy going forward. So in the 2020s, you'll be able to download cool fashion designs, print them out at pennies per pound, which is what it costs for three-dimensional printing. Uh, but you'll still, people will still spend money for the latest hot designs from their favorite designer. And I mentioned I've been thinking about thinking for a long time. 50 years ago, I, had, I wrote a paper when I was 14 how I thought the brain worked. There was actually very little to go on, but I described it as a series of modules, and each module could recognize a pattern, and that the essence of the human brain was pattern recognition. We actually weren't, weren't very good at logical thinking. Even then, I could see that chess computers were based on logic and being able to look ahead and, and calculate all the move, counter move sequences. Uh, the human brain did it by deep forms of pattern recognition. In 97, Kasparov was asked, uh, you know, Deep Blue analyzes 200,000 board positions a second. How many do you analyze? And he said maybe less than one. So how is it that he was able to hold up at all? It's his deep powers of pattern recognition. And I described it as a series of modules, each of which could learn a pattern, remember a pattern, implement a pattern, discover a pattern, uh, and that these were organized in hierarchies, and we created that hierarchy with our own thinking. And that the whole neocortex worked the same way. And that was actually contrary to the common wisdom at the time, because it was noticed that these different regions, and they do very different things, so it was thought they must be organized very differently. V1 in the back of the head recognizes visual images, because that's where the optic nerve spills into, and it can recognize the fact that the edge of this table is flat, that the, there's a horizontal crossbar and that capital A, and so on. Uh, the fusiform gyrus up here recognizes faces. We know that, because if you conk somebody over the head in that region and knock it out, people can't recognize faces. Uh, the frontal cortex is famous for language and art and science. They do very different things. They must do different, they must be using different algorithms. There was one neuroscientist who actually did autopsies of the neocortex in all of these different regions and found they looked exactly the same, the same neurons, the same interconnection patterns. He said neocortex is neo neocortex, the burning the mount castle. And so I used that, and I also used ex observations of human brains in action, which is still our best laboratory, and described this basic method. Uh, this actually describes the same uh, uh, algorithm, and actually describe how each of these modules, which I count now at 300 million, can recognize a pattern and learn a pattern. It's basically uh, functionally similar to a hierarchical hidden Markov model, which is a technology I worked on in the 1990s in speech recognition and early forms of natural language understanding. Uh, and it's a little bit different than neural nets because neural nets, the basic element is a neuron which can kind of learn one state, not really a whole pattern. And in my view, the basic module is a pattern recognition module that can learn a more complex pattern. And a hierarchical hidden Markov model is a hierarchy of Markov models, each of which can learn a, a fairly complicated pattern, and I believe that is how the human brain works. And that's what I'm doing here at Google. I've given an early version of this book to Larry Page a couple of years ago. Uh, he liked it. I met with him to ask him for an investment in the company. I was going to start to develop these ideas. And he said, uh, have you thought of doing this here at Google? We have these uh, terrific resources in terms of data and computation and talent. He actually said it in a very low-key way, but that was his message. Uh, so I met uh, with him, uh, Alan Eustace, who's here in the audience, and uh, they said I'd have the kind of independence I'd have with my own company, but these Google resources, and I've, so I've been doing that now for a year and a half. Uh, and it's been terrific. It's really the only place I could do this project, which has been a 50-year endeavor. 
And the spatial resolution of brain scanning, as I mentioned, is doubling every year. We can now see inside a living brain, see it create your thoughts, see your thoughts create your brain. And there's a few significant milestones in the history of the biological version of this thinking. You can see it up there, the neocortex. The neocortex emerged 200 million years ago with mammals. It was capable of a different type of thinking, basically hierarchical thinking. Other animals could learn things, but not with elaborate hierarchies. They could have a behavior that might have a hierarchical aspect to it, but it was fixed. They couldn't learn a new hierarchy, at least not in one lifetime. Maybe over 10,000 lifetimes they could evolve a new uh, behavior. Next significant thing that happened 65 million years ago, there was a violent change in the environment. We call it the Cretaceous extinction event. That's when the dinosaurs went extinct. That's when 75% of all the animal and plant species went extinct. Uh, and that's when mammals overtook their ecological niche because they could adapt their behavior quickly enough to cope with it. Next significant milestone was two million years ago. We developed these large foreheads, so we now had more neocortex. That neocortex is, has all these folds and convolutions basically to increase its surface area. It's a flat structure. It's about the size of a table napkin and just as thin. It's one module thick, uh, but it has so many convolutions and ridges, it's 80% of your brain. And the frontal cortex, it's often been thought it must be qualitatively different because it does these uh, you know, amazing things like art and poetry. But uh, recent, uh, recent research uh, projects discovered or examined the issue, what happens to V1, which I mentioned is in the back of the head and does these very simple things like the fact that this, that's a straight line. What happens to it in a congenitally blind person? They're not getting any visual images. Uh, well, uh, the frontal cortex notices, hey, V1 isn't doing anything, and it actually harnesses it to help it with language and art and science uh, at the opposite extreme end of the continuum of complexity of features, showing they, they're both basically using the same algorithm. And so we're already doing a very good job as primates without the frontal cortex. Now we had this additional quantity, and so we could think higher thoughts, because the neocortex is built on conceptual levels. Each level is more abstract than the one below it. So the first thing we invented was language. And that was about a couple hundred thousand years ago. So I have an idea in my head. It's a hierarchy of, of other ideas and symbols and other structures. And I want to actually communicate that and, and, and basically transmit that hierarchical structure to your neocortex. So we, we invented language in order to do that. And it's a commu communication medium that is hierarchical, so it could reflect the hierarchical structures in the neocortex. And the neocortex was successful because the world is hierarchical, and it's the best way to understand it. Trees have limbs, uh, limbs have branches, branches have other branches, some branches have leaves. Uh, the world is organized in a hierarchical fashion. And we could now represent this in language. And if you ever want to see some entertaining examples, uh, of the hierarchy in language, read uh, Gabriel, uh, Gar uh, a Gabriel Garcia Marquez novel. He has one sentence that's six pages long, and it's grammatically correct, and it has a fantastic array of hierarchical structures showing the indefinite hierarchy we can create with language, reflecting the indefinite hierarchy we can have in our ideas. And there's then been a continual acceleration of technology. Written language only took a few thousand years. The first examples were thousands of years ago. The printing press took 400 years to reach a mass audience. The telephone reached a quarter of the American and European population in 50 years. The cell phone took seven years. Social networks, wikis, and blogs took three years. Uh, we continually are accelerating uh, basically these information technologies because of the law of accelerating returns. And we can now simulate aspects of the neocortex. And fundamentally, uh, what my team, and we're not the only team doing this, is trying to create a functional simulation of the neocortex. And I'll tell you the key problem is we can create hierarchies. So even in the 1990s, we had a hierarchy of acoustic states, and then phonemes, and then word models for speech recognition, and then simple grammatical models so that we could have a sentence like, move this paragraph after the third paragraph on the next page, and it would carry out that simple command. But we couldn't actually add a new layer ourselves. That's actually, if you want to speak technically, the key technical challenge 
in trying to create more, more flexible AI is how do we create the next conceptual level that's more abstract than the ones we have automatically from the data rather than reprogramming it ourselves using our human intelligence. So I'll skip some of this to uh, at the very high level you have very abstract ideas like that's funny, that's ironic, she's pretty, uh, this 16 year old girl was having brain surgery and whenever they stimulated these points showed in red she would laugh, she was they wanted to be able to talk to her. You, there's no pain receptors in the brain, so you can do that during brain surgery. And they thought they were stimulating some kind of laugh reflex, but they quickly realized that no, they were triggering the genuine perception of humor. She just found everything hilarious whenever they stimulated these points. You guys are so funny just standing around was a typical comment. Uh, and, and they weren't funny. Uh, so. so an example from another company uh, that shows our beginning ability to actually understand human language is Watson. Uh, as you can see, Watson got a higher score than the best two human players at Jeopardy combined. It got this query correct in the rhyme category, a long, tiresome speech delivered by a frothy pie topping. And Watson quickly said, what is a meringue harangue? And Watson got its knowledge by reading 200 million documents of natural language, including all of Wikipedia and other encyclopedias doesn't understand each page as well as you or I, but it makes up for that uh, by reading a lot of pages. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we're trying to do here. We have a model that I believe actually will solve this key problem uh, of being able to add to the hierarchy automatically so that we can handle ultimately complex documents. So one application, for example, would be in language translation. Right now it does a very good job through the power of data and these Rosetta Stone databases of translated text by matching word sequences. We're improving the way that we match them. But we really would like to do it the way a human does it, which is to understand it. What does it mean to understand? It means to take the language and actually create this hierarchical structure of the ideas in my head and then resynthesize it, rearticulate it in the new language. That's the kind of thing we hope to do. We'd like the search engine to read for meaning. So if you put out a tweet, uh, everything Ray Kurzweil is saying at I.O. is nonsense. Uh, there's actually, in that simple text, uh, a hierarchy which you need to understand to really understand what, what that's trying to say. If you write a blog post, you have something to say. Now, search already goes substantially beyond the base for forms. It'll, it'll understand the syntactic structure. If you use the word he, it'll do that co-reference resolution. It, it, it'll understand synonyms. But it's not fully modeling the ideas that you have to say when you write an article or a blog post, and that's what we would like to actually uh, understand. And then you would be able to dialogue with your search engine to give it complex tasks and uh, interact with it the way you would with a human assistant, and it would then go out, and maybe it wouldn't even find the information that day, but a week later it would pop up and say, oh, you know, you asked me this question a week ago, and new research just came out that answers that question, uh, and so on. So uh, let's stop here, and uh, I notice our time clock isn't working, so I have no idea where we are, but uh, RJ, maybe we, you've got some questions. Yes, indeed. So I've gathered up some questions from, from people, uh, fellow Googlers, from some of our friends throughout the community, and uh, we're going to take this opportunity to ask some of these questions. Starting with a quote from William Gibson, the famed author, who said that the future is here, it's just unevenly distributed. Where do you think things are running fast and where are they lagging further behind than what you would have expected? Well, I think it's actually very widely distributed. Companies like Google and not just Google, I mean Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, are not just using these technologies with a few corporations and government agencies. It's in billions of hands. Um, Google search is used between one and two billion people, and, this, uh, and we hope to expand that to the next couple billion users and a couple billion after that. Uh, that's the business model, and, uh, and I believe that is actually how we will use these technologies. They'll be very widely distributed, and they're very democratizing. 
the technologies that move very smoothly are the sort of pure application of the law of accelerating returns when you get into you know, regulatory issues like we have with uh, the self-driving cars and it's maybe a little less predictable. There's a lot of regulation in medicine. Uh, but I, I believe these technologies ultimately will be so profoundly superior that uh, they will actually accelerate these regulatory processes as well. So you outline in your book how to create a mind, uh, the idea of what it's going to take to actually create a mind. And you've chosen to pursue these ideas here at Google. Why Google? Well, uh, it's actually the first time I've done that, but I've realized that uh, you need unique resources to do this. It's a very difficult problem. So for one thing, you need tremendous amount of talent. That's, I think, the uh, primary uh, resource. It's unique, uh, maybe not completely unique, but it's certainly evident at Google. Uh, and then, you know, you want to run something on a million computers and you want tremendous data uh, that reflects language. I and mean, we have, you know, tens of billions of pages, virtually all books and web pages. And uh, so I, this is not a project I could do with my own company, even if I raised all the money. Uh, that I could hope for, uh, and it's a it's a bold company that, that takes on major challenges and tries to improve the world with these applications and make them widely available. Uh, so I like the philosophy of the leadership. And... Me too. <laughs> it's true. So. Uh, but, but, you know, I'm an engineer at heart, and the engineer in me wants to know how you intend to build this thing. Could you describe to us what the engineered mind is like? What tech must we implement versus what behavior do we expect to emerge? What must be done in software? What must be done in hardware? Well, on the hardware requirements, I mean, to emu functionally emulate a human brain, I've analyze that. I, I estimated it at about 10 to the 14th calculations per, per, second, per second in singularity is near. So I hedged that a bit and said 10 to the 14th to 10 to the 16th. Uh, I've reanalyzed it using different methods in how to create a mind that come up again with 10 to the 14th. There have been a number of independent analyses of that that come with the same figure. Uh, we've already surpassed that, you know, uh, by three orders of magnitude in supercomputers. Uh, It'd be hard to provide 10 to the 14th calculations per second to all of a, a billion users, kind of using it, you know, more or less at the same time. I've discussed this with Larry Page, and he thinks, no, actually, that could be possible. But uh, the law of accelerating returns will make that easy, you know, by the early 2020s. So it really comes down to a software problem. I described, I think, the key software problem. Uh, we can already create these hierarchies. You know, in Google and in other companies, there's debate between several different learning methods, and they have pros and cons. Uh, we need one that can actually represent hierarchies of, of uh, complicated patterns, where each pattern has its position in a complicated hierarchy of patterns. Uh, and the key unsolved problem is how do we then add a, a conceptually more abstract level to that? And I think we can use machine learning to find the patterns you know, at that high level, but you need to be able to model them correctly. And so that's what we're exploring and then applying it to language. And ultimately, Google will apply it to other types of input like videos and pictures. And we're already making a lot of progress. The machine learning at, at Google is already very powerful. Once we have a system that's working, there will be little loops that are very tight that are taking up the bulk of the computation that we could put in, a, in an ASIC, uh, in a dedicated circuit because you can get a thousand-fold increase in price performance by uh, hardwiring repetitive algorithms in hardware. But it, and there are attempts, of course, to do that. I think it's premature now because we haven't really settled on the right type of machine learning, so we don't really know what algorithm to speed up. But, uh, but that'll be a straightforward engineering trade-off once we can actually master the software. So it's fundamentally a software problem. So most of the people in this room are engineers or you know, heavily involved in app development as well. And the, everything that you're talking about here, these are exciting visions to, to a lot of the people here and myself as well. But what, what, what can the developers in this room do to turn these ideas of yours into actual working products and systems? 
What role do these developers play in pushing all of this forward for us? Well, it's application developers that drive it forward. And I mean, there's a debate in the AI field between traditional artificial intelligence and something called AGI, artificial general intelligence, which is implicitly a criticism that AI has not pursued general intelligence and has gone off into narrow things like, like OCR, or speech recognition, or robotics. Um, but I actually think we get from here to there, there being future AI, strong AI, one step at a time, and the steps are applications, and we need to actually optimize the technology for the applications. It's very hard to develop a technology if you don't have something to optimize it for. And so I, I like the idea of crossing the river kind of from one stone to the next. Uh, people say, well, what about that part of the river where it's too deep and there are no stones? So, well, I'm not sure of the answer to that. But, <laughs> but we do get from here to there through one step at a time. And each step is sort of benign. It's exciting in the application world, uh, but uh, it's not you know, the grand step to, to AI, but uh, that's how we're going to get there. And the application developers uh, push it forward and, and make it practical and provide an economic uh, business model for it. So you know this, this law of accelerating return that you talk about, you've you've made it clear in, in natural space that it's, it exists like this. And, and in the technology space, it's definitely true. It all starts to feel just like natural law, like natural progression. Why do we have to work toward it? Why don't we just sit back and let it happen for us? Yeah, that, that question comes up a lot. Why don't we just sit back, let it happen? Uh, why are we working so hard? And if we did that, it wouldn't happen. So what is actually predictable is the human passion to make improvement, to use the computers of 2014, to create the computers of 2015. We couldn't do that a decade ago. Uh, and it, we're able to improve things uh, in an exponential manner. If things are 1x, we try to make it 2x. If they're 1,000x, we don't seek to make it 1,001x. We try to make it 2,000. Uh, and we have the tools to do that. Uh, I have a mathematical treatment and singularity is near. The, the empirical data is the strongest evidence for the law of accelerating returns, but it is driven by uh, application developers and technology developers taking each step with the current state of the art. Now, speaking of uh, the, the, the curves and the rising curves, um, I gotta, uh, sorry, I lost my place on my page here. Well, um, so the, uh, let's talk about specialized smarts then. There's a role for specialized smarts, and the neocortex seems to have a, a very general architecture, repeated architecture, as you were mentioning. But uh, there also seems to be specific modules that have evolved. Do you think there are specific functions that we're going to need to build for our learning machines? And uh, how do you know when to go really specific and focus on one particular thing versus just allowing it to be handled by the general architecture? Well, we, we still have the old brain, like the amygdala puts out an ancient uh, cascade of, of hormones to prepare us for fight or flight. It's no longer able to decide what to be afraid of. So your boss walks in the room and whether that causes laughter or fear, it's really up to the neocortex. And the neocortex is a general architecture. There are no specialized regions. There's no music region. Uh, but the patterns in music are even particular types of music, uh, whether it's uh, Chopin waltzes or, or hip hop, uh, are specialized types of knowledge. And we have a, a, a limited capacity in neocortex. So you can really be a, a world-class master of one thing. Einstein played the violin, but he was no Yasha Heifetz. Uh, Heifetz was interested in physics, but he was no Einstein. Uh, you know, we really need to devote the bulk of our neocortex, it's not devoted to everyday concerns, uh, to one type of knowledge, which has its own type of patterns, and learn the patterns that others have created and then push it forward. Uh, but really, the uh, architecture is, is pretty much the same. I find that fascinating. It's the same algorithm repeated. So uh, the, well, while it's great for all of us that personal technology has been freeing us up, uh, 
and um, empowering us all, giving us a lot more free time and giving us more capabilities under our fingertips. Do you think that we are actually going to make good use of it? The thing that I keep wondering about is, you know, are we going to essentially use this free time and all these extra d capabilities that computers give to us to allow us to watch more television and consume more sugary snacks, which is what I'm afraid of. So how are we going to use this technology that you're developing to ensure that we actually will live better? Well, there's always pros and cons. We just happen to be on the right slide here. Uh, and this is just one perspective. You know, people quickly lose perspective. We forget what things were like, you know, eight years ago before there were social networks, 15 years ago before there were search engines. We, once these things happen, we assume they've always been around. People certainly forget what things were like 200 years ago when Thomas Hobbes described life as short, brutish, disaster-prone, poverty-filled, disease-filled. Uh, we'll take a quick one-minute trip through the last two centuries. These are countries. The big red circle is China. It does some interesting things. Keep an eye on that. Uh, the x-axis is income per person in today's dollars, so you can understand it. So there were wealthy countries and poor countries, but nobody was very wealthy. Income per person was hundreds of dollars in today's dollars. Uh, on the y-axis is life expectancy in the 20s and 30s, worldwide average 37. So this was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, took, started in the textile industry in England in 1800. Uh, a few countries were making progress. Uh, but as you get to the 20th century, the 1900s, you'll see a wind that carries all of these countries towards the upper right-hand corner of the graph. The have-have-not divide does not go away. Uh, there are still rich countries and poor countries, but the countries that are worst off at the end of the process are far better off than the countries that were best off at the beginning of the process. And I shouldn't say end of the process, because the process isn't ending. It's going to go into high gear as we get to the more mature phases of the biotechnology and three-dimensional printing uh, revolutions, AI, and so on. That's just awesome, man. So, to be continued. <laughs> So, and um, uh, we, I think we might have a few minutes left to take some uh, questions from the audience at, at this point. If, if, is it a, uh, well, th there's two more left to ask, but I'm saving those babies for the end. Unless you have something you wanted to address. Um, well, I don't know how much time we have because the we, countdown clock isn't yeah, working. Yeah, the cl countdown clock's up. We have two minutes left? Oh, right. two minutes. Okay. Oh, all right. Well, all right. then, I'm going to skip to stick to my questions then. Sorry, you guys. Because <laughs> I've got one that is just one of my favorite interview questions. And I've been dying my whole life to ask Ray this question. So, if you would tell us, please, what are some of the more humbling experiences you've had researching and developing your, your concepts over the years? Well, I think it's this one uh, unsolved research question. Uh, that the human brain is able to do, and I think it's the key to making further advances in artificial intelligence, is be, the neocortex is organized in these layers, and each layer is more abstract than the one below it. And we're able to actually, if we understand something, like we understood speech recognition, we can actually identify, okay, phonemes should be here, words should be here, and we can create that hierarchy and then use machine learning to learn each level. But how do we then create a more abstract level uh, on its own? Because the neocortex does that. Uh, I've been watching my grandson go through level after level. Now he's almost three, and he's got quite a few levels under his belt. Uh, and, ha, ha, and that's done with the neocortex without really any external uh, input other than his parents uh, you know, saying, that was good, Ethan, uh, or Leo. Um, so, how do we do that? Uh, that's what we hope to solve. I think we can find, you know, have a stable set of uh, hierarchies and then find patterns at that level using machine learning and then add automatically add a new level. Uh, but that has never been demonstrated. And uh, if we could do that, I think we'll make uh, great strides in artificial intelligence. But so far, that has eluded the AI field. So then I'll, I'll end with this. You, you mentioned your grandchild, three-year-old. There's, there's certain definitions of the word consciousness that would suggest that a three-year-old has not yet achieved consciousness. Awareness of self, awareness of what's in the mirror, and things like that. Well, he would disagree with that. Part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
So I would like to end then with three simple questions that I would ask you to take all together for us. What is consciousness? What is free will? And what is soul? <laughs> I, uh, <clears throat> well, I always thought you had a good sense of humor. Uh, uh, so, yeah, one minute should be plenty for that. Uh, <laughs> We've debated that for thousands of years, going back to the Platonic dialogues. But to summarize, consciousness, whether or not an entity, <laughs> whether or not an, <laughs> whether or not an entity has consciousness, is not a scientific question because there's no, uh, there's no experiment you could run that would really definitively a falsifiable experiment that you could run whether or not an entity is conscious or not. We assume that each other is conscious, uh, that human agreement uh, falls apart when we go outside of human exper experience. People disagree about animals. They will disagree about future AI AIs. Uh, an AI could claim it's conscious. Eugene Guzman, uh, you know, claimed that he was conscious, but it wasn't very convincing. Um, <laughs> And so you actually, but you, so some scientists say, well, it's not a scientific question. It's not important. We should dismiss it. It's just an illusion. I think that's a mistake because our whole moral system is based on consciousness. Uh, so you need a leap of faith. My leap of faith is that if an entity seems conscious and seems to be having the subjective experiences it claims to be having, uh, I'll believe it's conscious. I would also make an objective prediction that most people will accept the consciousness of, of these entities. Uh, and so a, a valid Turing test, I mean, I have a, a long now Turing test bet with uh, Mitch Kapoor that by 2029 a computer will pass the Turing test. And we actually set a very difficult set of rules. I think if, if an AI passes that, people will really be convinced that it's really conscious and we will accept it as having those subjective experiences. Identity is really continuation of a pattern. People say, well, what are you talking about? I mean, your identity is this, you know, your physical stuff. It's this flesh and blood. But actually, this is very different than it was six months ago. All of our cells turn, turn over, some in hours, some in days, some in weeks. The different uh, components of the neurons, the tubules, the ion channels, the filaments change over in either hours or days or weeks. I'm completely different stuff than I was six months ago. So I make a comparison to water in a stream, uh, you know, it may make a certain pattern of, uh, as it goes around a rock, that pattern can stay the same for days, weeks, years, uh, but the water actually changes in milliseconds. So is that the same river? And there's a Chinese proverb, you can't walk in the same river twice. Uh, but it's actually a continuation of a pattern, and that's what we are. The pattern changes slowly, uh, but continuation of pattern, even if we introduce non-biological elements to it, uh, we would be continuing uh, that pattern. And free will, that's impossible to define. Uh, I would, I'm not convinced I have free will. Major decisions like starting a project, coming to work at Google, uh, speaking at I.O., uh, did I really make that decision? What was I thinking? Uh, 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 just seemed to, to happen on their own. Uh, I do actually think a lot, and, and I think I do have free will in deciding what to eat for lunch. So I think uh, making uh, eating choices is maybe the heart of free will. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, that's very good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ray. This is just awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> Excellent.